I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our knowledge engineering study group led by Daniel Friedman, attended also by uh, Kirby Erner. And we talked about building bridges to academic discourse. Um, we've all grown up in academia. I have a PhD in math from the University of California at San Diego, bachelor degrees uh, in math and physics from the University of Chicago. Um, Kirby has a degree in philosophy from uh, Princeton University. And uh, Daniel Friedman uh, has a PhD from Stanford and completed a postdoc at uh, UC Davis, where he did his bachelor work in biology, researching ant colonies. But he's also the president of the Active Inference Institute. So he's well established as an organizer, as a researcher, uh, with uh, people at the cutting edge of consciousness studies, um, in neurology, in biology, in um, knowledge engineering. Um, I, as you may know, uh, have been working independently all my life uh, on wondrous wisdom, a uh, language of wisdom, of conceptual frameworks, which is just completely foreign to how things are um, thought. Uh, and I've, every so often, I do make attempts to uh, try to enter the academic discourse. I did give 45 academic presentations in Lithuanian, in English. I attended the, the World Congress of Philosophy, gave three talks there, but I never could find anybody collaborate with, uh, except perhaps you. And um, I, um, uh, it's one thing to give an academic presentation. You write an abstract, you try to fit it in, and then you um, can talk about what you want, which is what I do. But it's another thing to get your results into an academic journal, uh, which would be peer reviewed, which would then let you cite yourself, let's say, and or other people to cite you and, and to enter into that academic discourse uh, as with an official theory. So, for example, there's different associations, um, the Lithuanian uh, Philosophers Association, I can say uh, the Association for Mathematics of Consciousness Science, they won't accept me because I don't have the peer-reviewed uh, articles. So, and then the question is, like, do you... Uh, care about that. That's why I started Math for Wisdom. It's just to say, well, I need to start my own community. And we have uh, uh, four study groups uh, led by PhDs, or uh, Aslam Kakar in sociology will be receiving his PhD, uh, hopefully next month. So uh, that is why this is so important for me. But it's good every so often to check and see, like, well, what happens if I try? So uh, in this um, meeting, I bring up um, a letter of inquiry that I wanted to write and I sent out uh, just yesterday uh, to the Journal of uh, Consciousness and the Mind Sciences. So this is like the connection between, uh, it's really a philosophical journal, but with regard to how consciousness connects with sciences, empirical sciences like psychology, neurology, cognitive science, and such. And they're very friendly. The special issue is on uh, structuralism and uh, consciousness. And so uh, it's the perfect opportunity. They have a diamond open access. That means it's free for readers. It's free for writers. It's perfect. It's funded by a half million euro grant uh, by the German government. Uh, and the editorial board is people who are at the center of the philosophical discussion of consciousness. So if you look at the description, you'll find the link to uh, my letter of inquiry, how that went. You can see the situation. But uh, so I ask uh, for Daniel, I'm sometimes a little bit frustrated, you know, but as for Daniel Kirby, like, what can they suggest as I write this letter of inquiry? I'm happy how it came out. And then that also leads to uh, Kirby's uh, interest in uh, Buckminster Fuller and Daniel's interest in as well with um, Buckminster Fuller being a visionary who was uh, had an academic position um, at uh, Carbondale uh, in Illinois, uh, but was a popular um, speaker around the world, uh, a, a noted uh, inventor and popularizer of uh, technologies. 
also the author of Synergetics, A Geometry of Thinking. And so Kirby, uh, as a philosopher, uh, just has this uh, passion for wanting uh, Buckminster Fuller to be part of the academic discourse. That's for, so for some reason, he sees that maybe this is the, the forum where that could be possible. So, and then what I try to say, and then they're interested to axiomatize um, Buckminster Fuller's approach, possibly like in the language of category theory, uh, just to make it more engageable uh, with the academic community. And I'm saying, you know, ultimately, like, as you know, I do invest in our own people, our own community, which would certainly include you if you showed interest, leave a comment. Uh, but why don't we translate uh, Buckminster Fuller's concepts into this language of wondrous wisdom, which is the whole enterprise of uh, Math for Wisdom. And that'll connect it hopefully to many other languages, uh, Plato, Kant, Peirce, um, Christopher Alexander. And so um, that's what this is about. It's it's running up with the challenges of building bridges or burning bridges uh, to academia. All right, happy 410, fellows. Andreas, first we'll begin with some comments on writing and positioning and working on whatever topics. Then we'll talk about a few other areas. So Andreas, go for it. Okay, so I'll share my screen, um, but I need you to enable me. Go for it. Okay. So every so often, it seems uh, meaningful to try to present this philosophy, a wondrous wisdom in an academic setting. You know, so I've given like 45 academic presentations, but I haven't uh, written papers. And what that means practically means that like the uh, Association for um, Mathematics of Consciousness, they won't accept me as a member. They go, well, when you write, you know, a paper or two, you know, they're peer reviewed, then we'll then come back. So this is simple things like that. So, and it's a good challenge. Now, um, uh, I forget how, but I learned about this uh, journal, Philosophy and the Mind Sciences. Oh, and it looks like uh, my, okay. Philosophy and the Mind Sciences. It's a diamond open access, which means it's free to read. It's uh, free to submit to, you don't have to pay. They got just a half a million euros of support from the German government. So philosophy and the mind sciences means it's a philosophical journal in the kind of philosophical style of discourse. Uh, but the mind sciences would be, let's say, psychology uh, and uh, ne neuroscience and everything, everything else like that. And so they're looking for philosophical uh, things informed by that. And now the current uh, special issue, if I go to the announcements here, call for papers, structuralism in the science of consciousness. Well, so uh, my theory would fall within structuralism. And I have a lot to say about the science of consciousness. I would call my theory the three times eight theory of consciousness, because I'm saying that there's three minds and eight uh, mental states. So I think that's a pretty neutral way. And so... Um, they're accepting, what's very nice is that they're accepting, you know, I can write a two-page letter, let's say, explain what I'd like to write about, and then they'll say, you know, it's not worth the trouble, <laughs> or they'll be encouraging, explain. So um, the problem is, is that, um, well, it's just very difficult for me to fit into this whole philosophical world. So I'm, I'm going to write out, let's say, these 10 different points to what I'm doing. You know, I'm going to, in the introduction to this letter, I'm going to say, hey, I've given these presentations. Here's like one sample that I gave uh, that I'd like to write a paper on. Uh, and I've, um, let's see, so that's that's how I'll introduce it. And then, then I'll explain, like, this is how I would structure it. Um, and so the first is maybe just sociologically the challenge that uh, if, you know, the complaint is that, well, we need a radically new approach for a theory of consciousness, or at least that's on the table, you know, just something radically new. The problem is, is that an, oh, an, an, an academic um, environment is all about incremental change. 
you know, so you look at all the thinkers like Freud and Marx and Kant and, and whoever, but like they did not operate in the academic environment of today, you know, basically all of them, all of these, you know, radical thinkers. Uh, so uh, just this huge limitation. And if you, uh, one more thing I want to say, like in the preamble, I'll mention that uh, I understand and want, you know, the need for dialogue. How can I enter the, the problem? How are we going to enter into the academic dialogue? And so I'm going to mention specifically Daniel, uh, paper he co-authored about uh, uh, the ant colony as a test for consciousness. Like you have a theory of consciousness, what could you say about an ant colony given that? So this is how I'm trying to uh, engage, let's say, um, with that. But I'm starting out then to say, well, if you allow that, you know, a radical idea is necessary, such a radical idea is not going to be an integral change. It's going to be a whole complex of ideas. It's going to be a whole different way of looking at things. That's a problem, but especially it's a problem if uh, if it's about absolute truth. So to say, look, there have been in my lifetime these taboos against uh, scientific theories of emotion, you know, consciousness, causality, uh, animals having feelings, plants communicating. That's all changed, uh, but... Uh, Still, things like wisdom or God, uh, maybe even that's changing. But like absolute truth is just off the border. And so to say that um, an academic environment in principle uh, is stacked against this whole idea of absolute truth. Just to lay that out sociologically. So strategically, um, to say um, what I'm doing is I'm presenting, uh, working with, let's say, on, I'm presenting an alternative um, approach based on grounds for absolute truth, which means removing personal experience, removing this kind of like conceptual language um, and seeing how they, you know, connect underneath. But um, then you have to robustly do that. So it's important that I'm a person with a very robust personal experience and to try to talk about as if I did not have this, that this was some other people's experience or whatever, that just seems not going to, you know, that's just, I'm going to I'm not going to do I'm going to do this. I'm trying to say. So I do talk about like my personal background, my personal history. Where did I get to, you know, what's the approach that I did? Where did I get to where I went? Then intuitively, like a reconsideration that introspection is something highly critiqued, um, you know, at a certain point historically. Uh, it's not even maybe so clear. Well, it may mostly because it's not replicable in a certain way. So then I want to say, well, I want to talk about a very particular type of introspection of the available perspectives that I can take in a given frame of mind uh, without changing the context. And it's really about relating the part and the whole in a certain way and intuitively feeling that. So then I describe basically these divisions of everything and three operations on them, which you know add one or two or three perspectives, which become like these three minds that I'm talking about that will define consciousness. And then culturally, I say, well, OK, what could be the evidence for that? Well, first of all, to say here's dozens and dozens of examples, and I don't think I would go through them, I just list tables of examples where I align them to say this is where they come up. Then to say mathematically, and so this is kind of like a research program that I'm outlining. You know, I'm not saying that I figured it out. I'm just saying this is a research program to work in this way. Mathematically, to give examples in advanced mathematics uh, where this cultural thing is coming up. Maybe before the math, I might even just say neurologically, uh, not maybe scientifically, but like in the cultural sense of neurologically. So like these uh, distinctions made between left brain and right brain and just the whole, you know, I would give like my interpretation of the brain, but uh, that neurologically from a cultural point of view, mathematically, then epistemologically say, I have this procedure where like I systemize the ways of figuring things out and it leads to 24 ways of figuring things out, which demonstrate like how these three minds are working together. And then academically, in conclusion, like to say, okay, applying it to the end colony, these are the types of results you get. You get a mind that's um, uh, out in the world, you know, organizing these streams of ants, let's say, you based on just how they're wired for rates of change. You have a semiotic world deep inside, which is uh, clean of all kinds of fungi and whatever, but it's just uh, based on uh, language of smells uh, that uh, they're greasing onto each other, let's say, up and down. And then you have a uh, hypothetical third mind, which would be whoever's maintaining the ant colony, and that'd be the nest maintainers. I mean, the actual physical architecture, the, the nest maintainers, they have all the tools available to downplay the queen, upplay, you know, the queen and her consort, upplay them, that mind, 
downplay whatever, you know, they may be working with these scouts, uh, they may be working with the nurses, but basically that would be the layer of overlap where I would expect there to be consciousness. So that's just a saying, like that's an attempt to, um, maybe the last thing would be, uh, Kevin Mitchell has this interesting article on um, eight layers of free a of agency. So I would try to uh, see if that could relate to those eight minds. So I'll be working on that. So that's, and so basically when I write this, I'm just going to say, this is the way I would naturally try to introduce my theory. Which of these, you know, I would just do a general overview. I think it's up to like from eight to 20 pages is the typical article length. So of course this would have to be quite brief. But I think that the best way to, is just to present it as a research program for, uh, you know, in kind of more like a, a sharing a personal experience of like, you know, what is this like? Um, as opposed, but you know, if they think I should instead focus on any one of these, then they could say like, which ones to downplay or upplay. So that's what I'm intending to write. What do you guys think? I'm looking at the archives right now and I'm just, I haven't clicked on anything yet mm -hmm. for philosophy, mind science. I'm just wondering, have you, since the back issues apparently are available, have you checked the previous issues to see what kind of article they are accepting? Yeah, so um, I think um, I, I just started doing that, and that's a very uh, wise and important thing to do. Um, and it just seems, it really does seem like a philosophical journal, you see. So they're not giving like, uh, you know, it's not an empirical journal, let's say. like, And so when philosophical, they have the whole... Um, uh, the style is basically like, here is a, it's an argument style. It's, it's, it's proceeding by arguing. So like, here is a thesis. It is accepted by certain people. Here is another thesis. It is accepted by another group of people. Here is the evidence, you know, here are arguments for and against. This is the history of the whole argument. Here are some insights or observations. So that's not very, um, that's, I guess maybe that's the point is I'm saying like, this type of theory doesn't in, it doesn't make sense in that environment. It doesn't it would never arise in that environment uh, because uh, that's well, basically because uh, that's a thinking within a box. I see. mean, I, another thing I would check is how many footnotes on average they seem to expect to other people's writing. If it's all self-referential with just a link to Daniel's ant paper. Is that way out of the norm or is that kind of... Well, I know I have no problem introducing footnotes, you see, or like writing, you know, I mean, I'm going to be dozens and dozens and dozens of examples. I mean, but not that's not the to your stuff, right? No, no, not to my stuff. I'm saying to other people's stuff, you know, like, so there's no, there's a wealth. It's just a waste of time. I mean, in a certain sense, it's a... I mean, it's a waste of time to do too many of those and it's a waste of time to do too few because you want to be right. accepted. So what I'm saying is try to imitate the style that they seem to prefer maybe it's very clicky i have no idea i don't know anything about this magazine but you know well i think it's an it's an impressive click so uh and it includes people that daniel's or or no it includes like for example the one of the uh, editors in chief is a uh, vise i think his name is uh, or weiss uh, who was recently interviewed on the active inference visa visa okay so this is like he's one of the four or now three, I think, uh, editors in chief. Right. But not so, for this special issue. But um, but anyways. Uh, so given that, I would say you're in the right place because active inference seems to permeate both this magazine you're saying. And here's Daniel and here's and so on. That reminded me I'm down mm -hmm. the road some point need to understand better the concept of surprise in the active inference paradigm. Like there's a lot to say on that, I know. And I wanna hear from Daniel about it and stuff. Daniel, have you have any thoughts on this whole thing or or not? Uh... Yep. Because synergy and synergetics. I'm not about surprise. I'm saying about the, about my- uh... well, well, Yeah, let's come to surprise in a second. Yeah, first let's continue here. All right, here's what I um, was just writing down. Mm -hmm. Um. You're bringing a, a 24 card deck to a game usually played with fewer than 24 cards, but for people who are looking at each other's hands, um, it's a lot to put into one paper. You're right that it is a broader program. So seeing this as kind of a keystone 
slash landmark publication can be a good way to do it. There's no way to have one linear artifact be like all the rhetoric, all the footnotes, all the quote rigor, accessibility, et cetera, for all people all the time. So it's like, it really, that's, those are the, um you know, critics slash reviewers slash audience slash et cetera. And so amidst all of these kind of cultural things, which you're very aware of and experienced in, also the best artifact in deep time and what a good editorial slash reviewer slash journal would uh, scaffold is like your truest contribution. So I, uh, I think it's good to aim true from what you want to say fully given the super compressed limits of journals and then for for all of the linking and so on, that's like the wiki, and all and and everything. So, um, like, and that's not but, yeah, that's not. The, I mean, yeah, that's a non-issue. Yeah. Like they'll you know that's well, that that takes care of itself. But uh, yeah, but being non-compromising, even though you do have to compress massively, mm -hmm. and and just um, then then just uh, the uh, just copy the outline. So here this this these are the kind of some of the facets of the research oh, you copied program it mm -hmm. it, it just copied out the first word yeah well, i philosophy papers you're right they are more open in format than like an empirical paper which would be like you know introduction methods results discussion right and philosophy papers some there's just section one section two section three some there's you know less or or so it's basically open so there's no format that they they require likely but but then kirby got to the brass tacks it like if it's um one and a half space times new roman 11 that that is helpful to know um yeah so they they i yeah, mean they yeah. that's all that's all available and, so that's and, not a problem and, right and also there's this kind of like fun slash play of journals at all when also using sites like Zenodo, um, you can upload any file and also get a DOI with no, it can just be a slideshow. So this is as citable as anything. And, and so in the broader scheme, be just downloading websites and uploading them to Zenodo or cross posting with Zeno with GitHub snapshots and Zenodo mm -hmm. or, or other uh, DSI, Pipeline. Zenodo is like Orchid, is that right, Jaren? Um, Orchid is in a unique identifier for each like researcher, but mm -hmm. Zenodo is a preprint quote server. Okay. But for archive, you need to know somebody, you need to be endorsed in, and there has to be the LaTeX formatting. Whereas for Zenodo, you can upload like gigabytes of data. So it allows you to upload, and you can also mm -hmm. connect it to your GitHub so that when you do a release on a GitHub, it um, saves it, stores it in Zenodo, gives it a DOI, then you can put that DOI back into the GitHub, like README. That mm -hmm. makes the GitHub repo versionable and citable and archived like at CERN. So that would be pretty cool to set up for some repos just to explain. Well, I think maybe, maybe just practically speaking, like if I run into length problems or you know exposition problems or whatever like i can offload you know i can write a preprint you know an article or or whatever and upload it you know to archive or to or, or you know to wherever like you know so um that's um that's just a workaround um in case you know anyway so understood yeah. but what in terms of the um see maybe it's it must be said like you know one of the motivations for this probably was your arrival to our group you see because uh knowing that uh uh oh well like with anybody who would want to work with me i would say okay what could we work on i think we spent some of the initial sessions on that and then to say okay you're into ant colonies you wrote this paper i could respond to that paper i could write a paper responding to the paper this is a good time to write a paper like would that be meaningful you see so I did quite a lot in that direction uh, because of you, really, because, you know, 
so to say uh, and to show that well i'm i'm interested to work together right so i have uh, five months where i can do what i want to do and probably like if i got permission to write this paper then i'd probably be focused on that i could possibly like i could easily go to warsaw for the semiotics uh uh conference uh, world conference they have in there every few years uh that not be too expensive it'd probably be under 500 euros but like for example i wrote to the pierce group yesterday and nobody replied you see so and i've been to those kind of congresses i was at the last one it was actually in lithuania <clears throat> the world conference and you know what's the point like i can be there no one wants to really interact in a deep way the way that we do you know here so that's just uh, being old enough to realize like um, it's not about any of this eggnogging. It's just like, is there a single person in the world who wants to have a deep uh, relationship? Here's the question. You just said, if I get permission to write this paper, I was wondering what your plan was. Are you going to submit a completed, here's my paper, take it or leave it? Or are you going to send them a bunch of writing and say, should I make this into a paper? Is it worth it? So, the, that, so what they what they suggest, what they offer, they say, you know, um, the rules are that you know you can submit your paper up to August fifteenth, right? Which is typical. But you, if you like, write us. We'll tell you, you know, we'll give you you know, we'll give you feedback on how we see this fitting or not. You can do an inquiry. Oh, that sounds worth doing. Yeah. Yeah. See, so I'm, I've been spending like a month or two preparing this basically like so this whole ant colony thing kind of like converge with this so if they say no then i stop the ant call i mean i've already stopped the ant colony research you know i got i got as far as i needed for this purpose of this uh letter of inquiry i say i think i have an idea of what the three minds would be for an ant colony that's good enough right so i can write a couple sentences about that but um then it's like um yeah, so I want to get this out and get the rejection as soon as possible so I could move on. I think maybe that's what I'm doing. But if they accept it, if they're encouraging, it's a big deal. Then they, that doesn't mean they'll accept the paper, but it does mean that they think it's worthwhile. Did you want anyone to read the paper before you submit it, such as Daniel? Well, I'm asking for some attention now. That's why I wrote the context, right? Like you're three steps ahead, Kirby. I am three steps ahead, and it's the worst. Yeah, but we're we're talking about step one right now. You, see? you can't you can't talk about step three. It's secret. Well, I'm asking. I'm not gonna. How can I say? I'm, uh, how can I say? Um, it's easy. If they accept and they want this paper, Daniel, I hope you'll. Read it's irrelevant, that. Kirby, because uh, if they reject, it's irrelevant. It'll be relevant when we get to step three. That's how. I mean, I, what I'm trying to say is that I'm asking for feedback on this outline right now. Okay. We don't know what what will happen after right. even just deciding about the outline so that's of a good focus we of course well i think maybe one yeah. want to say like like yeah. daniel uh, just get, just to be real like daniel took the outline put it on the web you know organize it whatever that's all fine but that's all optional you know really the real world relationship is about will you tell me what you think about this argument do you see it doesn't matter what you do with knowledge if I you mean, don't my do question anything is, with the knowledge does this guy andreas kulakowskis like people to read his papers before he submits them or not. That's all I care. Yes or no? The answer was yes. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Um, okay. Let, let's continue a little on, but a few interesting pieces. Like one part that you emphasized now and here was like your personal approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's like kind of a very fascinating and important question. Like what's the part that's transferable? What's the part that's personal? Um, and then it reminds me of an early kind of moment in my active journey with this Wired mm -hmm. article, 2018. And it was like, to understand it, free energy principle, what's Carl Friston's apostrophe S, free energy principle, bringing last names into it. And to understand it, you need to peer inside the mind of Friston himself. Now, earlier in that year, in the interview with Carl and Martin Forger, who passed away, we kind of had asked him some questions and then he self provided the, the supplemental piece that am I autistic personal reflection on his childhood. So it's like on one hand earlier in the year, we had just had this sharing of what his 
mind himself was, of course, not the whole thing, just those pieces. But already this idea was being positioned as being something that needed to be entered through a persona lens. It's belonging mm -hmm. to a person and you have to understand it. But we don't need to understand Darwin's mind to understand natural selection. Now, that's super fascinating and like the versioning of his work and the context of evolution and the beagle and all that. There's well, a whole but, but, but but you don't need to understand what Darwin thought about a given thing to understand. But, but, the, but, but speaking to yeah, and speaking to what I was saying, like Darwin could not have been published in an academic uh, environment. Whether philosophy, I mean, today, I mean, like in that structure, like you can be Darwin, you can be Marx, you can be Freud, you can be anybody. It's just not happening. It doesn't happen. You don't get these radical leaps uh, in academic world. That's at least that's what that would be the the positioning I would say. So, uh, sociological, and then um, yeah, those steps that seem you know I, I would work further on that, but yeah. That then, seems that seems reasonable, I think, right? Or it, to it I brings in my department. It brings in many continents of scope, and so that 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 for the genre can feel like um, de depending on what the paper purports mm -hmm. to be and delivers upon, and the expectations and the preferences of the editors. That's that's venue specific, but yeah, let's continue to explore what uh, more towards the actual um, contents of structuralism. I'll bring this this paper in. This was um work where they they generated variational autoencoder um neural network machine learning mm -hmm. with a latent space of smaller dimensionality, but a compression type latent space. And then they made those um, as commonly done for like visual and for auditory input. And then they developed second level representations that um, descri that described properties of those networks. And they are using category theory to explore the structural similarities and differences between like the invariances of auditory and visual inputs based mm -hmm. upon their symmetries and how just from looking at the topology of a neural network, you could determine like whether it was trained on on auditory data or visual data because the, the data have different structures for the sensory modalities. So they, their optimal like processing architecture slash um, what kind of topologies they have are different. And I, I think, uh, I, I, it, it not mentioned here, but we can take that in many ways towards um, in inver invariances in the structure of higher order mental representations, hashtag synergetics, geometry of thinking. Mm -hmm. Like if you get from, let's just say sound has a certain signature at the first primary processing level and um, visual. But then once you mm -hmm. get to the word level representation, if it goes four, 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 then that's empirical evidence for a minimal tetrahedral meta representation. Or if it's found that there's a cycling or a a, a triune coexistence of three, or when there's a directional move from the two sum one way, right? And then you could say. Okay, here's the category or type or scheme for all of such transitions. Here we're going to be looking at just the ballerina visual illusion. We already have a data set, simpler model explained more variance. Here's a unique mm -hmm. prediction. Here's a unique explanation. Here's the fMRI data. Here's the next study to fund. All those are part of like the research program. But just taking that one kind of structural approach to a very sub problem because it does get down in the weeds with the empirical which is what people kind of broadly associate with the scientific endeavor mm -hmm. 
And so like in the like in the neurolog neurological section would be like one of the smaller sections or one of the small points, but uh, and, and partly culturally driven. But I think like the kinds of things you're saying, like where does this tap into these types of things? Like, you know, this architecture. We could, um, so I just wanted to, I'm really glad we could talk about this and that you could give some initial feedback. And so anything, if you write letters or if, if there's places I could find, you know, your, uh, um, you know, your input, et cetera. Um, but maybe this can segue into what you wanted to talk about, like yeah. on axiomatization of uh, synergetics, just in the sense that uh, there's similar obstacles, there's similar questions and issues, you know? Yeah. So for this topic, um, on more on the applied side, like just trying try to learn category theory by doing and bring in some mm -hmm. of these higher ideas into developing like modular packages for synergetics with Kirby. Like mm -hmm. how can we bring in certain category theory structures or like comments in the code so we can understand like okay when can we flip out or how and when can we flip out ivm for xyz or how, how i i don't know it just makes you know how to how to so, use the package and how to use the tetraball.py mm -hmm. so it's coming from the applied side and then there's more of the theory side about how do we axiomatize what is already organized in a kind of decimal format it's highly mm -hmm. referenceable but again there's no linear argument to it that's what kind of the decimal scheme is making clear mm -hmm. and so how do we move that into more of like a structured form i can i can just maybe uh in give share what i have discovered as an outsider self-learner who's gone pretty deep, you know, so I mean, I made the Yo Ne Dilemma video, it got 6,000 views so far, and that's uh, without really any challenges to it in a certain sense. Um, but so my feeling, my conclusion basically is that uh, a lot of category theory uh, from the point of view of wondrous wisdom and such, it's just verbiage, you see. They would like to think it's foundational in some way, um, but and I could maybe speak to what what that's all about. But basically, in a certain sense, that's just fairyland. You know, there's no real. Um, that's not grounded in anything real. That's like uh, mythology. You know, so number one, number two, there's this general program of um, category theory, which is important to know is that it's about restating mathematics um, instead of having mathematical concepts like set membership. You know, is a um, element of set B, let's say, right? They're saying, well, that's specific to sets. Can we re-express that in a language which uh, doesn't have to do with the objects or with such conceptual relationships, but can be strictly in terms of external relationships of the kind that you get in category theory, where like you have these uh, mappings, let's say, these arrows. And so the arrows have a uh, very important, but um, uh, constraints, but like there's got to have an identity ergo. You have to have composition, you know, well defined, but you also have to have it associative. And once you have that, it turns out it locks in a lot of things. So you can have a category of groups, but then you'll have like a category of group homomorphisms that preserve group structure. The point being that you can re redefine, um, not redefine, but re-express set membership as a fact about certain types of relationships. And so you can let go of the whole language of set theory or any you know group theory or whatever, and you can retranslate it all into external relationships and facts about them. Okay, so that's interesting translating project, but what does it yield? On the one hand, it just yields lots of verbiage, okay? And the verbiage, it's very repulsive in a certain sense, you know, for someone who's trying to master ideas because... But there are two things in category theory that really do run deep in terms of like cognitive thinking, like cognitive reality. So one would be this Yone dilemma, and I made a video about how it relates to this foursome, whether, what, how, why. That's basically the fundamental theorem of category theory. The other one is what you show the video on is uh, adjunctions. So adjunctions are like analogies. And so if you wanted to like, what are the analogies in mathematics? Uh, what are the... Um, how do you um, not equate two worlds, not have an isomorphism to worlds, 
not have an invertible map between two worlds, but instead have just a window between two worlds where within that window, their information is matching and the same. But when you go between those two worlds and those with, via that window, you don't go there and back. You go there and there and there, back and back and back and back and back. You get these non-invertible um, relationships, but they work like analogies. So that is something I've uh, preliminarily systematized and I work on that is very important. Uh, so just to conclude, like when you say I want to use category theory, you see typically what that would mean would mean that you're just entering into this very superficial, fashionable language, which is really awkward and gives you nothing, but is a lot of trouble and it's just kind of snooty, you see. But there's a, I've tried to explain the, the deep things would be this adjunctions and category, you know, so it's, then there's maybe all levels in between, but that's really what it's all about. I concur with a lot of what Andrea says. I don't think it's high priority to map synergetics to category theory, but on the other hand, I think making thrusts in that direction opens the space for people who are into it to say, oh, well, let me show you how it's done. You guys obviously don't know anything. I will show you. So I'm trying to uh, inspire the show offs to jump on stage and do it for me. I'll watch and I'll clap. Well, well, you see what can be done, you know, at least I claim can be done, but um, is to say um, synergetics can be mapped into wondrous wisdom. That's the whole point. And so I give a simple example of that. You know, I mean, I've already just turned any page and you can, you know, it, it can be decoded. But like he says, oh, mother, father, you know, father, mother, child, that three relationship is one of the most fun. It's perhaps the most fundamental. He doesn't explain. Right? <laughs> so, but see, I can I can explain it. You know, it's the the first mind, second mind, third mind. You know, so the mother would be the unconscious. The father would be the conscious. These are typical gender stereotypes. But the child in becoming having consciousness has to play off those two minds. See, it's a very simple explanation. He doesn't give one at all. So I would run with that. But but um, there's lots of things that could be done. And see, then what wondrous wisdom does, it gives a critical eye. It just immediately shows like there's holes in his buckets or not, you know, or they carry water. Do they carry water or do they not? You know, and of course, vice versa. It's a test of wondrous wisdom. So that yeah, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be very I'm interested. I'm all for to... that kind of synergy between the two. I'm all for it. I think that's going to happen organically and it's already happening to some degree. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Like it makes me think about whether what Jerry presented yesterday mm -hmm. or uh, some graffiti that was scrawled on a wall, mm -hmm. there can be a comparability proposed, comparability as proposed to a better refined version of that framework in relation to. I what think do you mean? We, we have this idea of Turing complete already in the language now that we share. And I think I would say as an axiom, any sufficiently complicated or complex philosophical language is Turing complete in this other sense that wondrous wisdom would embrace that, you know, it's got all the mental mm -hmm. emotions. It's got what it means to be a human being. It's got all the interiority that you need. I'd say right. there are thousands of such languages, some more accessible than others, right? That's part of the point. It's like um, how accessible is X or Y, you know, you only have so much time. So that's, a, that's a very nice by, way to put it. I mean, yeah. the, basically everyone's language has the means that you need in order to do anything, so to speak, you know, within the, it's just a matter of decoding people. Right. I think. And so like when I ask people's deepest values, their relationship with truth, these are steps towards decoding, you know, or if I map out their, you know, epistemological portrait, like these are all steps towards trying to shake out of them. What is that language? You know, like, can we make it visible? I mean, my yeah. just to be quick on the axiomatization thing, I have to admit I have a bias against it because my mode is to rescue synergetics and bring it back into the humanities and stop mm -hmm. letting these math, physics, STEM people, the STEMites, mess it up because they don't get it. They don't know how to read. They've been deliberately schooled to not think metaphorically. 
So it's kind of like, what are the axioms of Finnegan's Wake? Phonemes, I guess. It's Phoenician. Yeah. Well, that could be part of the truth drop slash learning. But also, this is, I think, a very useful partial analogy. Like, if to the extent it's even useful slash true, because it's like, well, how could this person have walked around with this three sum and this with this when they're not overlapping it's like because they're maps of a territory common territory for the cognitive maps maps can be made of totally non-overlapping materials to represent totally non-overlapping scales territories etc those are comparable in a cartography space but but there's all these fallacious like blatantly fallacious topics like how is this map um you know better or worse than this territory which is like yeah. a type error contained within a value judgment so it becomes a, a, a at least in the short term an irresolvable framing but there's other less blatantly incorrect ways to set it up and then the other thing it made me think of was like someone says okay you know this is like A, B, and C. Like there's like three things about this. And then it's like, that is the taking a stand with relation to all the lists that you know, they could have just said A and B. They could have said CBA. They could have said A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, so then what's the accuracy minus complexity? Like what would be the base optimum number of parameters to list? Or maybe you listed only mm -hmm. four because of rhetorical value, or you did only two because that's how long you had to speak. It's like, then you could talk about the constraints in a space of that and then but even pulling back to that level has already abstracted like the disciplines entirely away because once you're discussing whether p-value of 0.05 or 0.06 or 7 you're already in the statistics domain so even one mm -hmm. layer away from the thermometer data and like the ant colony foraging activity we're already in two layers a space <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> maybe two yeah yeah or three because someone had to observe it and then they had yes. to write it down you know uh, and then they had to depending on how many it. layers yeah, yeah different ways to think about the layers there but i just think about in the paper it's just going right. to go from like thermometer data to the p-value i know there's like data sets in, in between but just right. like then even the discourse around statistics and the philosophy of science and that does get sociologically embedded and yet it references components that to the exclusion of the sociological, they're included by exclusion. Which is a common theme in um, Giorgio Agamben's work. Very like interesting. Homo sacer. I mean, there's the higher and higher level you go, the more meta, as we say, it gets to be simpler and simpler heuristics, you could say like that. So wondrous wisdom is, say, a set of heuristics. But I wouldn't, that's getting more and more zoomed out and more and more general, more and more. Whereas I think of axiomatization as atomization. You're going the other way. You're trying to get down to irrefutable. We could have a longer discussion. What is an axiom? I'm happy to think but, of axiom as like a rule on the back of the box of a game you're about to play. Like in Parcheesi, a move is this, a spin is that, and these are what you do. Those kind of axioms that define a game like chess, we want to bring in chess, it has axioms. This is how the different pieces move. But once you start claiming that to be an axiom, you have to be, quote, self-evident, there I think we start getting on a slippery slope. And in that sense, you know, I don't know. Synergetics is experiential. I think we like to say that. Also, Applewhite used to say that section 200 of the book, the published book, the enumerated sections 200, that was the pithiest, most axiomatic kind of sort of distilled way of presenting synergetics. He also said it was the section that pissed people off the most because it's so like, bam, 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 bam. This is what synergetics is, bam, bam, bam. And it gets people like riled up. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. So anyway. as, as an alternative to axiomatization, I wanted to propose, you know, like creating words, verbalizing um, this humanization of Buckminster Fuller. So uh, the idea is like 
and I think that's why you know you both can do this. I'm certainly think of Kirby, like where what is it that strikes you about his whole um, you know approach to life? And I think that when I was doing that epistemological portrait, I'd gladly come back to that. But like that pops out right away, things that don't seem to get listed very much. So like, and I just based on the Wikipedia page, like so, I have here uh, um, the his three cycle. It would be like, well, you hear from the universe right, as a validator. So he's got these moments in his life where he heard from the universe, right? Then you live your life as an experiment. So he, you know, he, you know, like, for example, what can a single individual contribute to change the world and benefit all humanities? And then you self-reflect about your life as a search for motivation, like, you know, after his drinking and whatever. There's this huge three cycle. Uh, and so he does it on a very grand scale, you know, among other scales. But uh, that's very easy to ignore. You know, I don't know how much he actually writes about that, but it's in his biography. It's clear, like in his life, uh, he thought of himself that way. So, um, but but to, to, that's just me, not really a, um, a follower, so to speak. But like if Kirby or Daniel or others like say, well, this is what's really cool about him. You see, that can be the portrait's foundation. And we talk about Darwin a lot and, you know, Malthus. And I think Fuller... One of the big questions he asked, which I think a lot of philosophers don't like Kant, I don't know if he ever asked this or Schopenhauer, any of them, is there enough in principle? And what does that even mean? Okay, you could talk for an hour about it, but it is an obvious question to ask. And it's like, why don't more people ask it? Is there a way that humans could, in principle, do okay? And I think the answer Malthus gave us in his first attempt at this of the world inventory was no, no, we cannot. And here are the reasons, geometric growth versus arithmetic and so on. But that thinking didn't just stop in the 1600s, it kept going. And Fuller asks it now in our century with the technology we have, we always have to put that in and the knowledge we have in principle, is there enough? And he came back with yes. And I think that's why his critique sounds different, because he's saying the big problem is humans for millions of years have assumed there's not enough and they're all programmed, auto-programmed, especially British Empire type thinking to it's you or me, it's me against the world, it's the battling superpowers, it's the regional, uh, you know, we're all in it for ourselves, the selfishness, whatever. And Fuller is saying that reflex conditioning is all wrong and our higher mind is telling us that and we can pull out of it but we're like very awkward we're like retarded really humans are not and we don't like to see ourselves that way we're very proud species i don't know any more proud than a human being so to see yourself as awkward and retarded and unable to make the world work is very humiliating and i kind of think that's kind of a religious experience you go through sometimes where you realize you're just a bunch of clowns. I think that's kind of the crisis synergetics pr promotes in people. He said. That's very interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of parts to synergetics and Fuller and like just I mean, according to him, like right now, what we could be doing, we're not, obviously, but he wanted to hook up the power grids more, and they are hooking up. It's like in Europe, you look at a map of all the power grids, and Netherlands is hooking to Sweden, Sweden's hooking to England, whatever. But he was ready for us to hook the eastern and western hemispheres across the Bering Strait. Let's have the great power grids of Siberia and China hook up with the great power grids of Canada and North America. And we can be doing this by the year 2000. So here we are in 2024. Obviously, we're nowhere close to that. We're having tank battles instead. We're killing off millions of people instead. What's to be proud of? Nothing. But I think if you're with Fuller, you see that it could have been different. And so you don't, it's not, you don't, you don't really pity these humans. You just realize they're retarded. Too bad. I guess there's nothing to do. Just watch. That's the down, that's the kind of the, my misanthropy. I try to keep it under control. Well, in, in the case of Fuller, there's, like I mentioned, this uh, um, 
strength of God, you know, or this voice from God, like that's kind of like uplifting him to where he can. And then the result is like where he can say, say, I'm going to experiment with my whole life, you know, but then he can fail and see, you know, well, I'm, you know, I have problems with alcohol or whatever it is, and I'm just not up to my, and then God lifts him up again. So it's, um, He's an interesting character. I just think the fact that he did come out with a coherent kind of mathematical system has been overlooked because there's been a campaign to discredit him and say he just popularized other people's ideas and took credit. And I don't think the originality of synergetics is sufficiently appreciated. And so I'm kind of on the war path and have been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Once synergetics suddenly becomes, oh my God, this is something interesting. We could teach this in high school. I feel like then my my work is done. It's like, then I can go off and, you know, have a party or something. But right now I'm still working at it because I don't feel like we've crossed all the lines I want to cross yet. Yeah, this really strikes me as I think you may have used the words, um, something like, Andrea, scientific endeavor stacked against the notion of absolute truth. Not not the scientific, the academic. Oh, oh, sorry, academic. Thank you. Important correction, because um, it um, you know, it, that's the sociological and the, the theoretical, which are kind of co-occurring, just like mm -hmm. like mind and brain, um, or mind and body, and so it's like, well, why four? It's like, well, there's a whole section on the rhetoric of the Tet, and there's all these reasons, and the volume, and the IVM, and the vector equilibrium, minimum system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because three would be too few, and five would be too many. It's like, da-da-da-da, but you could choose any. There's a category for that, but four is the one for this reason. Here's the IVM XYZ package. It's like, okay, but you're saying it could be five. It's like, well, yeah, there's a sense in which it could be. You could imagine a shape, but like, just try to do it or work out the math, but here's four. It's like, well, but the door's never shut. And so it's like there is like a recalcitrance and then an, a, another shadow or one part is light, one's the dark of each other of like, well, publishing for novelty. So it's like you can publish, quote, new results. But then there's this, oh, well, we do. We don't we don't re go to old experiments, even if we're not sure mm -hmm. about them. So it's like, why? Because a new result, something that shows a difference is different and publishable and reportable in a, in a news media. And so then you have a unknown unknown thumb on the scale towards simply different. And all of the cognitive biases that that supports and induces in tandem with a sort of like fractal mafioso paradigm and so it's like there's so it's so complex that like how it gets sublimated down to the last frontline worker, the whole apparatus, and like sometimes seemingly the kind of Kafka esque metaphysics that like a worker embodies thoughtlessly yet for decades. I mean, I'll, I'll write the, you know, I mean, I have to summarize these things for the inquiry, but so I have to decide like what to include and not and what to say for the paper. But one thing being like any type of radically new way of looking at things is not going to be one idea. You know, it's going to be a complex of ideas. So, whereas academic environments about a single, you're lucky if you can get a single new idea in, you see. So to have this whole new world of ideas just isn't going to, it has no entry way. But then furthermore, like the academic world is removed from life. Like there's this wall between the person experiencing the life and what you're writing about. But the whole point being like, the the, the thing I'm, it, it's, it doesn't allow for that wall. Like, you know, you have to be engaged in what you're doing, etc. So, you know, you are, a, so just starting with very simple things like that, or the whole interdisciplinary nature of it, like to have a radically different way of looking at something like consciousness, 
you have to look at all aspects of life. You know, you have to be able to argue it on all levels of uh, science, right? So that doesn't fit in any single domain and it doesn't really fit in a, into a meeting ground of a few domains. It's just uh, way out of way out of line. So no, it's it's that's amazing. And it, it makes me think, well, bundle of experience, which is mm -hmm. actually just simply the phrasing that brings many people in to Fuller, including mm -hmm. like in our trim time right. colleagues, like people love this idea of like Fuller as a bundle of experience. Everyone is a bundle of experience. And then the life is the the container by which you can co-enter because they all the the person is a complex co-occurrence. And then this just really made me think about like ivory tower, all this. And then it's like, are we like just plastering the inside walls with what we're like supposed to be studying? Totally disconnected. Do we have like a window? We're like looking at it. Or are we all, but we have to go out and do the field work because if there's, if the wall is perforated, there's no room, but since mm -hmm. the wall can't be perforated or some can't, then you have to make the person go out. Mm -hmm. So there, that's, that's, I think very interesting, important. And then also just to surprise, I'm, I'm fine to say mm -hmm. for a while, if you guys are, but, mm -hmm. um, Here's one. Oh, here's with this, the active this, instruments. This right? was, like, yeah, but presentation. This is one, I think, excellent just work that is in a mathematical cul-de-sac unless it gets connected up and out. They're, they um may, identified 18 mathematical forms. Oh, wow. So maybe axiomatization might even be too strong this is kind of, in, in a sense, this is the 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 Jerry research path. So, what is surprise? Take a constructivist, multi-notational approach to how how is it a surprise being used? How can we cap, care and then make units of of meaning notationally to generalize other over uh, other um, over other notations, and then. Um, this provides like the bottom up and the lateral glue that increasingly can be translated so we could support like making better programs about surprise, whatever it is, holding multiple surprise concepts up, making a surprise package where you could like easily call these functions. Is this so it's, uh, it's, open linked? Um, it is, uh, it's here in, in the notes for the day. Okay. The link to what you're talking about is right there. Yeah. Taxonomy surprise definitions. Is, um, oh, it's a YouTube. Okay. Got it. Uh, and, and the paper here and the paper too. Oh, okay. Great. So it doesn't answer which surprise concept to use. Um, but it's the kind of like. Or sometimes we joke about this type of thing as like the I saw a bird phase of natural history, like a nature mm -hmm. publication it used to be like, I was here and I saw this. Mm -hmm. It was like, and then the whole, then there becomes a, a massive apparatus. But early on, there's sort of, it's just like documenting and mm -hmm. categorizing and and um, creating comparabilities, draft comparabilities is is critical enabling necessary but not sufficient work mm -hmm. because the the bottom up is necessary and the mind is necessary and that's a hard that that's a hard a hard um point to bring in to work where like this is the pinnacle of bottom up not not the infinite pinnacle i mean local maxima of incredible, rigorous, you know, bringing together decades of work with just three colleagues' efforts to to mm -hmm. to actually move things forward in this very unique way. And and that whole workflow that I uh, set up for collecting conceptual structures or cognitive frameworks, however you call it, is very much in that spirit. Like you know, you somebody finds something, they have a place to dump it. 
then somebody else can go and they can curate it. Then somebody else maybe can actually put it nicely in a table, you know, of a general purpose table. Then somebody may curate it um, in a, in the particular school of thought that they that they care about, like wondrous wisdom, let's say system. So there could be they could having a sharing. So that should be collaborative. And and I wrote to the Pierce group and they just didn't even respond. You know, like I was so happy to find this thriving group, uh, but. Uh, and anyways. Yeah, wow. Some some groups respond slowly. Well, I think it was very telling. Uh, ben Udell, I, I think I maybe said this yesterday, but like I found the trichotomies page, you know, oh, and I figured, you know, someone's work to make this list. So we go to the history page. I found, uh, he calls himself the Tetrast. Uh, his name is Ben Udell. He's a founder of that Pierce uh, discussion group. And it turns out, he really doesn't relate to Pierce because he's into foursomes, but um, Pierce was into threesomes, you see, but he was hoping at least they're not into twosomes, you know, but they're not into foursomes either. So it just it felt very lonely, you know. I tried to encourage him, but he said, like, our math is way over his head, or, you know, the topics we do is way over his head. So we'll see where that goes, but um, he's the founder of this, so one, the co-founder of this community, just... So I think maybe just in terms of goals, like the reason I'm submitting um, my inquiry is just to do a reality check, you know, once a year or so often uh, to say, is there a way into academia, you know, to do that bridge building? And likely, you know, if if yes, that's a perfect opportunity. But if no, that's understandable. Then to say, well, it's not the philosophy crowd, but maybe like if I did a breakthrough in math, like if I could explain bond periodicity. So uh, that could be maybe, see, mathematicians have a different uh, interest. Uh, they're not, uh, they don't care how you get the results or why you got the results. So maybe that's the way to go. But the crucial thing ultimately is just finding people like you and learning to work together. Uh, so that's why like this whole, uh, we could have worked on Buckminster Fuller's, you know, together a year ago, but it's just a matter of like figuring out how would we do that? You know, what would we, what would it mean? Why are we doing that? But certainly I'm, I've made efforts to show that I would work on that. Uh, Awesome. All right. Well, I think it's all going well. I'm I'm thinking we're on track. Mm -hmm. You're thinking more. I'm sorry. What you're thinking more? I said I think we're on track. Okay. Good. Very good. Yes. Great epistemic adventures. Very interesting. And surprise. I mean, is the name of the game. And known unknowns and unknown up, unknowns. Unknown well, and surprise was one of the themes of the uh, video that uh, uh, Daniel saw when he uh, it was about emotion. So there's a division of surprise there. So, um, and so maybe uh, who, who, Daniel, would you say a prayer? I don't know. I have nothing to say if you want to, or we can have a moment of silence. Moment of silence. Okay. Thank you, fellows. Farewell. Next time. Bye. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives, and the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work, and um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or bi, you know, semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been, have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.